I'm uh, Herb Johnson. And, uh, I guess I know something about vintage computing. I uh, got a degree in electrical engineering in 1976 and started playing tape at microprocessors at that point. And I've been building, working, fixing, um, taking apart, putting together tape bit systems ever since. I do other things, but that's one. Um, this is going to be a fairly casual talk because I've been thinking about the subject of computer data cassettes uh, for a while. I've been working on it or with people who have been working on it. But I really didn't have time to prepare a uh, proper talk with uh, uh, lots of videos and exciting uh, tidbits and uh, the histories of and so on. But that's all right. We have the internet for that. So there's a web page on my site, which is this. And this is my local copy. Mostly I want to do two things. Number one is kind of get a little bit background about the use of audio data, data cassettes in uh, mid 70s and 70s microcomputers. Uh, then talk a little bit about some work that's being done today that I think is really interesting in recovering that data. If you do the math, that's about 35, 40 years ago. Um, but I was worried about two things. One is the recovery of that data, and the other is, did anyone care? Well, I found that some people care, but some people don't care because they don't know. How many people in this room today have held that? They even know what this is. Does everybody know what this is? Well, you laugh, you laugh. But I ran into somebody, good academic background, proper schooling, proper uh, parents, and all that good stuff, 30 years old, had never handled it. Barely knew what it was. I think they saw a picture in a, in a movie once. Right, person? That's okay. This is the march of technology, the march of generations. So I was a little worried that people today simply wouldn't know you know, your 21st century people, simply wouldn't know what this is, wouldn't think much of it, uh, and uh, would go, go into the dust bin of this. Um, I'm pleasantly surprised to find that people are having fun. But for those of you that didn't use these on a regular basis uh, in your youth, this is, a, this is an audio set report. This was a thing. This was a media device that people carried around. This is something that you could buy. Cassettes for There were recordings on these. Popular artists of the time recording on these. This is from Linda Ronstadt. You could go to the store and buy these as recorded tapes. Just like you would buy, just like you used to buy a CD or used to buy a DVD. This is something that allowed you to take music with you. You can carry it, listen to it on the beach, anywhere. This is something uh, that was relatively inexpensive to produce, so it kept their costs down. Not only that, you could record yourself. See, there's a microphone hole. <laughs> so you can actually do recording. Recording is no small thing in the world of media. Media in general become a lot more popular when individuals or small companies can record on them. It's nice to have vinyl records, and of course everybody knows the history of vinyl records, but they're not easily recorded upon media. So for ordinary folks, the idea of making a record no, you can't do that. But you can make a cassette, and people did it. They recorded voices, they recorded people singing, they record stuff off the TV and radio, uh, on and on and on. So the capacity to record on media is essential for popular uh, acceptance and for making money. Uh, you can look up the history of the Phillips cassette. I think the Phillips company uh, established a standard sometime in the 60s, uh, Wikipedia, blah, blah, blah. So today, today, you can go to Walmart and buy one of these. I think that's amazing. They won't sell you any cassettes. They won't sell you pre-recorded cassettes, I don't believe. But you can still buy one of them. 
Now, I didn't really have time to record a uh, audio, digital audio cassette. But just for fun, we'll just play this one. How many of you are familiar with the rock show? Sounded better on a boombox. Well, sure, sure. So there you are. You've got a technical analysis already of what's going on with the audio cassette. Small speaker means high frequencies are easier to hear. Uh, you don't get the boom boom because you don't have a big speaker. But if you hook this up to a bigger speaker or used it on a stereo system, you could get better for quality. There was a lot of work done with Dolby on uh, 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 audio compression and expansion to make to uh, produce relatively high quality audio cassettes. But you gotta remember the expectations of the era. This isn't a talk on audio cassettes, but uh, that was all right for the times. People didn't expect a lot. They didn't know what the future would be. Funny. So the capacity to record and play meant that this was an opportunity in the era of early vintage computing, now vintage computing. An opportunity to use this as a data storage for the call device. What do you need for data storage? Well, you need to be able to record, you need to be able to play back. You need some control over the media. So, this is pretty good. Pop it in, play, rewind, forward, you got it all. Uh, connections are straightforward with volume jacks for in and out. Pretty straightforward. So it's no surprise that uh, uh, smart techies got the idea of using these to store data. Well, what's the difference between data and Linda Ronson? Not too much. If you look at it technically, what do you have to do for data? Data is all zeros and ones. So you have to have a way to use an audio to represent a one and a zero. That's not too hard. And then you have to be able to detect that and produce it. Now, I'm not going to give a talk on assembly language. I think there was one earlier today. Ah, go on the internet. But the idea is audio is a representation of uh, a voltage level, a signal, over a period of time. Anybody that's looked at an oscilloscope or used the oscilloscope display on Audacity or so on, those you have complicated waveforms. So in the digital world, you have simple waveforms, ones and zeros. You can feed a one or a zero, a, a pulse, a, in a period of time into a cassette recorder, and it will record it. It won't be nice and square, but that's OK. So all you want to know is duration. Signal goes up, the signal goes down. If it goes down for a short period, it's a one. If it goes down for a long period, it's a zero. Or you can play it in the frequency domain. If it's one frequency, it's a one. Or if it's another frequency, it's a zero. Or you can do it in the time domain. Two pulses is a one. Five pulses is a zero. Let me see if I can bring that up on this, uh, this one. Everybody with me so far? OK. Yeah, if you bother to read the text behind me, you'll see it, uh, it replicates what I'm saying. Oh, yeah. Uh, blah, 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 blah. 1967, Claude McKay, the Western Electric, a local folk hero in computing, wrote a paper called The Home Record. He said, well, you know, computers are going to be everywhere soon. And they're going to be real small, they're going to be expensive, they're going to be home devices. Well, what can you do with a computer at home? Now, that's a question that boggles the mind of everybody that made computers in the era. Why the hell would some ordinary mortal need a computer? There's no data, there's no software, there's no hardware. People that knew 
that technology, the microprocessor, was on the horizon. That big chips would get small, big computers would get small. Small equals cheap, small equals fast. They figured out, well, you know, people play music, they'll play music on a computer. People type, well, they'll type on a computer and so forth. And maybe they'll use some of those music products, cassettes, for data because it's the pair. There's your ones and zeros. Here's what I was talking about. Here's a little waveform. This is an actual waveform from a, one of many digital standards of the era. Here's five bits, excuse me, here's five cycles of activity. That's a one, there's two cycles, that's a zero. How can a computer measure that? Well, that's about all they do is measure time durations like that. You run a little program loop. Yada, da, 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 oh, one, da, 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 oh, zero. Uh, it took that long, must be a zero. One, that must be a one. You can write the programs in your head if you're that kind of person. Nothing too complicated, right? Let's So there are another number of computers in the era that use these kinds of cassettes. They're all mostly different. There are a few standards in the era, but not too many. Uh, most computer companies did their own things, or most individuals did their own things. Uh, one popular standard in the era was called Kansas City. Uh, if I remember this story, it was essentially some uh, uh, computer convention in Kansas City where uh, a number of people, uh, I think Wayne Green comes to me, said, well, we gotta have a standard. Said, everybody can use everybody's stuff. Well, they came up with a simple standard called Kansas City. Uh, 1,200 hertz tone is, is a one or a zero, and a 2,400 hertz tone is a zero or a one, I forget which. Uh, so you'll find cassettes that are like that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how you deal with this stuff today. Uh, yeah. mm. So today, we come across these old cassettes. Uh, Sometimes we can recognize the computers they come from because they have labels. And we listen to them and they make funny noises. And we go through the literature and we figure out, ah, here's some ones and here's some zeros. And so you can digitize audio today very easily with Audacity or other laptop computers. You can hook up a cassette to them fairly easily. You have very similar connectors, often enough 40 years apart. Audio jack, audio jack, audio plug, audio plug. So, you digitize it. What does digitizing mean in this context? Well, it means that you're taking the analog signal, you're, you're passing it through a analog to digital converter, E to D converter, and you're representing the signal as a value, an 8-bit value, 16-bit value, or a 32-bit value. Well, you've got to make a decision about how often you sample that audio tone. You want to sample it often enough so that you can recover the data on. And there's a little bit of uh, communication theory about that. But you know, here we are in the 21st century. We've got laptop technology that can digitize stuff at 40,000 times a second. 44,000 is a uh, uh, relative standard, I think, derived from CDs. I think. CDs, audio CDs, actually have digital data that's sampled it that way. So you, you can create ungodly big files to, to digitize what amounts to uh, a few kilobytes of, of actual data. 
And so people do that because they're used to the idea that, oh, audio, it's got to be sampled like crazy, so you get the full fidelity that we're used to. Uh, so uh, what happens at the other end of this is, well, I want to pull the data from that cassette. How do I do that? And I've got this wave file. Well, what you have to do, in most cases, is condense that wave file down from lots of samples, 32 bits, to maybe fewer samples, and maybe 8 bits. And then you write a simple program that does what I just talked about a few minutes ago. It essentially counts samples, looks when a sample goes high, starts a counter, looks when that sample value goes low, stops that counter, looks at the counter and says, oh, that's this period of time, must be a 1. Or, as that waveform uh, showed previously, you do that count, oh, I counted this five times, I saw five waveforms, that must be a 1. Or I saw two of them, that must be a 0. So, various ways to do that, and people are doing it. So, Herb? Herb? Yes, sir. Yeah, are any, is anyone uh, saving uh, computer programs from uh, cassette tapes as WAV files and then playing the WAV file directly back into the, to the target hardware? And, and doing that. The answer is yes. Um, so, in the course of the last few years, I've been looking at people's uh, work on I.O. cassette storage, a little bit on digital, too, because you can play cassettes in a digital way, too. You can actually store a digital signal. Those are called digital cassettes, cassette decks. And some of the big, big people uh, in the computer era of the 80s and 70s used the digital technology. Trying to play those in the audio uh, cassette deck today is tough because there's certain mechanical problems. The tracks are in the wrong place for the head. As you know, you've got the tape. This will just take more minutes to explain. So if you run across the digital tape, <coughs> this is actually a stereo audio tape. So, we've got two stereo tracks on the top edge of the tape, you know, two stereo tracks on the bottom. So, the way this works is your head only plays one half of the tape. So, when you flip the tape over, now you can play this. Makes sense. Two stereo tracks, well, your head has to have two sensors, one for each track. Well, what about these little cassette reports? They're monophonic, one track. That's okay. What they do is they have one bigger head. So they can play both tracks at once. Pretty clever. That's called, that's called backwards compatibility. In the digital world, they may use heads of a different configuration, so the tracks won't line up with them. So that can be a problem. That's about all I'll say about digital. I'll give you a I was asked <coughs> who's playing back stuff today right into computers? Let me dig up a page on that. See if I can get it. Nope. Okay. So I'll just walk through the uh, list of people I came across that are working on this stuff today. But I'll start first, a little further down. So these are the people that are working with uh, this kind of stuff today. And as I, obviously there's many more people than I've listed here. This is just a few, a few months. Ah, uh, let's see. Ah, Tony Brogan. So uh, he's around here today. He's a big Apple II uh, fan and supporter. So there's a website. Is that link active? AsciiExpress.net. 
Write that out so you can find it. So this is kind of interesting to me. So Apple II stuff. So the first couple years of the Apple II, they didn't use uh, floppy drives. They used cassettes. So bunches of vendors came out with their games on cassettes for the Apple II. And they were also producing games for uh, Radio Shack, Atari, whatever else was in there. So what this site has done is they've gathered up WAVE files of all of these cassettes. And they give you a little program. And the program lets you uh, uh, it's, it's an Apple II program? No, no, I believe the Apple II natively can do this. So you can download the WAV file, play it into your Apple II through the cassette port. On your Apple II, you say load, whatever that file is. And sure enough, it will load. So that's interesting. So you can do remote loading of these audio, audio uh, cassette programs. They also produce a program which will let you load a whole disk of Apple II files. So it's an audio file. Quite a wave file. Hmm? That would be quite a long wave file. I guess. But it represents a whole disk. Well, you don't have yeah. two single sided uh, encoded disks. Not that much oh, data. Yeah. So you just have to be patient. Let's keep in mind this is 1970s, 1980s technology. You have to be patient. It takes some time. That's how long it took to take. There you go. It's much faster than paper two. It's faster than paper two. So a number of people are doing interesting stuff. Here's the list. See if I can walk through these. This is a digital uh, uh, cassette deck. The NFC M800 was, was an 8008 computer, which came out uh, 73, 74. It was built in Canada. Pretty sophisticated computer. It ran APL. It was sold for financial analysis. Big bucks. You haven't heard much about them because, oh, again, it was sold to a limited community. And then when the 8080 came out, much more inexpensive computer, they, they sort of lost market share. But SD Sales, I need to say. Um, SD Sales was a company in uh, the mid 70s that produced all kinds of electronic kits. And when microcomputers came out, they produced a simple kit to. Uh, uh, digitize uh, audio cassettes. Very simple interface. If I had had my wits about me, I would have brought it here today. But it's a little bit hard and it has some very simple electronics. Now this is interesting to me because I'm an affectionado of the Cosmic. How many people here know about the Cosmic 1802? Okay. It, it, was a, it was a New Jersey microprocessor. It was produced here in the Garden State. It was designed and engineered by Joe Weisbeck, who was an RCA engineer. And he engineered a, uh, a series of microcomputers, which have commonly been called ELF. Uh, and uh, uh, it's interesting stuff. It's an interesting little microprocessor for many reasons, so not the subject of talk today. But uh, people have become interested in working with these old ELF derivative computers like the Quest, the Super ELF, the ELF 2. Cosmic Vic was another RCA microcomputer which had simple video graphics. Uh, there was a video game machine which uh, came and went. 
and not much notice call the studio too. That's a cosmic call. So, uh, the, uh, as people were working with these uh, various cosmic machines, uh, they also worked with the Sarnoff collection and with uh, another uh, library called the Hagley. So the, uh, the Hagley Library is in uh, Maryland and has a large collection of RCA materials, mostly papers, but they also had a bunch of cassettes. The Sarnoff collection has a bunch of uh, RCA uh, artifacts, computers and things. And in fact, tomorrow and Sunday, there'll be a, a Cosmac exhibit from the Sarnoff collection here. So anyway, people interested in the, uh, the gaming technology, the video uh, technology, the VIPs, and uh, uh, the Studio 2s, and so on, kind of came across these archives and encouraged both of those collections to digitize them. And if you go to my website and follow all the magic links, you'll find a kind of complicated story about how people, how the uh, museum community is working with the vintage gaming community to bring these uh, uh, games back to life. Uh, one of the most interesting things about uh, uh, this uh, tour I've taken of uh, audio cassette data and then leading me into the Cosmax is that there's quite a gaming community, a community of people that are emulating uh, vintage games. Uh, not a big interest of mine, but it's a it's, uh, big interest of many other people. Uh, but they've been very active in uh, trying to recover all kinds of programs. I mean, of course, they did this in the world of the Apple II. They've done it in other vintage computers. But now they've found this archive of development, uh, early development uh, uh, games from, from RCA. And uh, eventually, not too long from now, those will be available to, uh, to, uh, to everyone. Uh, Visual Group uh, was another uh, uh, vintage computer company out of Denver. Uh, they came and went, sort of, but they had a good idea. They thought, well, we're not going to be tied to any single microprocessor. We're going to build a computer that covers them all. Uh, they built them, uh, they distributed them, they had some business problems, they went away. One of many early vintage computer companies that uh, didn't stand the test of time. But they had some cassettes and people digitized them. <clears throat> Don Tarbell, uh, how many people know the name Tarbell? Okay, Tarbell came out early with a uh, floppiness controller, but he also came out early with a audio cassette board for the S100 bus. So uh, I think he used two different standards. And on and on. Polymorphic computers, they used the cassette. Myths out here, they use the cassette, the MSI used the cassette on the MIO board, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, let's see. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. How are we on time? It's 11 13. When's this talk to the end? 11 40. Okay. I'll be done shortly. We've covered these already. Ah, so once I started looking around at the, the world of audio cassette tapes, I came across other kinds of tape used for digital. Uh, and if you go to my webpage, you'll see some of the, some old. Um, yeah, something I didn't know. Radio stations. I mean, here still listen to radio. Okay. Well, they have product announcements from time to time. Well, before everything got digitized, how would they play these uh, uh, product announcements? Well, there was a popular technology. It was some kind of big cassette thingy. Just plug it into a machine, and boom, there's your, your four-minute spot, or your 30-second spot, or your two-minute spot. Some of them. Use that for digital. It's tape, it's audio, wow. Yeah, months stereo cartridge. 
uh, vaguely uh, similar to old A tracks. Can you imagine using an A track for digital? I think a few people tried. I don't think it ever became particularly popular. Okay. So that's most of what I wanted to cover today. What I wanted to do today is to sort of introduce the idea that there used to be these audio cassettes that used to be used on microcomputers. It's not unreasonable to use them again if all you're doing is just playing the old games. And people are out there today uh, working actively on, on digitizing these so that they're available on the web, but also preserving them because even audio tapes uh, eventually uh, wear out. Even audio cassette recorders eventually fail. Although, like our microcomputers, we keep going anyway. I think it's bothering that you can get a tape that somebody recorded in 1975, 76, 78 on your dinky recorder. 40 years pass. You plop it into another recorder. You've got it. It's back. The data is there. What Until other, the tape moves. What other technology gets matched that? <laughs> yeah. It makes you wonder. It makes you wonder. We you know, you know our technologies today our 21st century computers and so on. If we get a couple, three years out of a laptop, we're really surprised. Our smartphones, we use them for a few years and trade up before they even fail because we want more features. 40 years from now, how much of the digital technology we have today is going to be accessible, uh, functional, and recoverable? These are, these are tough questions, and these are serious questions when it comes to data. Data storage is the same sort of problem. Today, we store, we store stuff on, on flash drives. Will they last 40 years? Uh, we store stuff on CDs and DVDs. Will they last 40 years? Well, maybe. So I Will think- Will there be drives? That's the problem. That's the other problem. It's not just the medium. It's the devices that play. Will they survive 40 years? I don't think so. So that's, that's what I want to cover today. But the other thing I want to do is turn the talk over to you guys, because some of you are doing great stuff out there with audio cassettes and audio cassette technology. So I'll take some questions, but first let me find, does anybody have anything interesting to say briefly about their work with audio cassettes and microcomputers? Yes, sir. Yeah. One of our engineers at Living Computers Museum and Labs in Seattle, Washington, has been doing some stuff with the uh, uh, TRS-80, where he's taken the tapes and scraped them off onto a uh, an iPod, and then plugged that iPod into the TRS-80, and that has been successfully loading programs. TRS-80. Mm -hmm. Pod, okay. and they've been playing uh, tapes. So I'll program tapes into the iPod. Okay. Uh, so does the iPod have uh, audio input? It did have an output that just plugged directly into the the connector that was available already. Sure. And that, how about the input? How are they digitizing the tapes? That I'm not sure. Right. He probably. I think he just used a regular little cassette player and, and played it into the iPod. Oh, okay. So, just so the then that uh, audio connection to to jump over the cassette player, which is uh, you know irritating and mechanical. Yeah, and a lot of people are doing this here at the museum, uh, Vintage Computing Federation Museum. Uh, they use iPods to uh, uh, play uh, uh, audio tapes into uh, uh, a couple of computers. I think uh, I uh, scrolled past it one point. Anybody else having fun finding this? Well, I've been trying to, I've been trying to archive a couple of audio cassettes that have data on them. And these two cassettes have, um, there's a squeal that I get like a mix, like an in from the tape that's not the recording but the tape itself oh. and it's interfering with me recording 
um, the actual data on there. And I was wondering if you had any idea, any thoughts well, right here. Yeah, I'll try to answer that. Maybe somebody else will speak to it. Okay. So here's how tape goes. Tape goes by. Here's the head. Tape goes that way. Here's a roller. And here's a cap stand. Kind of an interesting bit of mechanical technology. So, tape has to run at a constant rate. Well, you, you have a little motor hooked up to something called a cap stick. It rotates at a constant rate. That establishes the rate of the tape going past the head because if it goes at different rates, you get a frequency shifts. Remember, I said frequency is data, you don't want frequency shifts. So, to keep pressure against the cap stand, you need a roller. Rollers are made of metal. <coughs> and you, you want a scary stuff. Open up an old cassette recorder or an old 8 track or something, and you'll see what four decades does to run. It does not. So, the squeal is most likely because this roller, which used to be a little bit sticky, is now a little smooth. And the reels on the cassette, maybe they're jamming up a little bit. So the squeal may be the roller actually rubbing against this cap stand, rubbing against the tape. And just like you put your finger around the glass, you get a tone. So that could be the source of your squeal. Is that something you were going to speak to? Yes. It's actually called sticky shit. It's okay. uh, common on um, scotch tapes 110 and 120 manufactured for a few years. Mm -hmm. What's happening is the binding is absorbing <coughs> water from the atmosphere. Okay. And it d develops a bit of a stickiness to it on the oxide. As it's pulled across the head, it sticks, then it's pulled away. It sticks again, pulled away. It gives a very characteristic screech mm -hmm. as it tries to pull across the metallic rewrite head. Um, you can look that up. There's some research papers. Library of Congress has uh, developed techniques for that. The easiest way to, um, believe it or not, to do it, to, to treat it, is actually bake the tape mm -hmm. at about 120, 130 degrees Fahrenheit for about, uh, about eight hours or so. That raising the temperature drives off the water. Uh, what I personally do is I have tapes like that. I usually pick January and February to transcribe them when the humidity drops to like five percent in Philadelphia. And the normal temperature of my home pretty much handles that. But there are techniques for doing it. There's a fellow on Germantown Avenue who does this professionally and you can take your tapes there. He'll do the transcription for you for more money than I think you have. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it, it has that, look it up on the web, it's called Sticky Shed, it's common, it's a binder. The oxide is held onto the tape with something called a binder. And just just, just a few manufacturers just used a, a cheap tape at the time. And it is recoverable, but you've got just a few hours after you bake the tape to do it, otherwise it starts absorbing the water again, and you're right back. It's not a permanent solution, but you will be able to recover it. Do not play with the squeal on it. You'll damage a great you'll bet damage the tape and the lead right in. Okay, why don't you contact me by email? Maybe I'll give you a paragraph on my uh, on my thing here. There's a whole world of audio real to real technology. That's what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, in the whole world of audio real to real technology, real to real tapes go back decades more than sets. Consequently, we are seeing the sorts of problems we may well see in the future or seeing now with cassettes. So the things they do to recover those tapes is astonishing. And the level of detail, as, as our friend demonstrated today, the knowledge of particular media, brands, and so on, is, is quite astonishing. So we can draw upon their experiences to uh, recover our audio cassettes over, over time. Uh, any, uh, any other, uh, yes sir? On the uh, Atari 8-bit line, the cassette recorder was stereo, and um, it would store data on one of the stereo tracks and store audio on the other tracks. So when you would load a game program or uh, educational program, uh, as the data is loading into a computer, it would play instructions in, in audio or music 
on the other track, so it's pretty interesting. Yeah, it's funny you should say that. This is one of the things I discovered. Uh, I don't know much, so it's new to me, but it may not be new to you folks. So, yeah, I know these tapes are audio tape. We're using them for data, but you can still use them for audio. Let me see if I can play something. This may take a moment. Uh, how many times? It's 1125. When is this in? 40. 40. Oh, plenty of This is bowling. So, so it's bowling. <laughs> <laughs> but that was a good guess. <laughs> my, my poor friend who was. Uh, you, you can hear this pin song. Who was uh, digitizing that particular tape out of the head because it had that same bowling sound many, many times. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, plus the how about that? So this was a tape from like, like 73, 74, 75. So this is your multimedia computer. You know, in the 1970s. Can you imagine? Yeah. Interactive, audio, video. You hit it all. So that was anything else? Just I was curious, what kind of bit rates, data rates for a G with the audio? That's a fairly good technical question. You can kind of look that up. Let's see. I'll get technical for a few minutes if I can bring up the information. Here we go. So the Cosmac VIP was a uh, Cosmac computer ran at 2 megahertz clock, 8-bit microprocessor, but the serial uh, ALU in it. So it used eight clocks for its fastest instruction. Two megahertz divided by eight, not very fast. But it was a pretty good processor, has other nice features. So the bit format is, as I said, uh, one of those formats where you have long, uh, low frequency is a one, and a short frequency is a zero. So your audio data goes in, your audio data comes out, you establish the threshold, and that's your digital stream. And here's the technology needed to do it. Dirt simple. Well, I'm a digital engineer, it's dirt simple to me. This is an op amp. This is the uh, digital output of the uh, Cosmac. This is a simple filter that takes that square wave and rounds it off a bit. So I think this was an A. Uh, 
or excuse, uh, this is B and this is C. So here you go. Likewise, coming in, how do you want to deal with that? Uh, um, coming in, that, that audio signal, well, you want to clip it so that it squares it up a little bit. You don't want the value to go too high, voltage to go too high. You take some of the higher frequencies and you pass them off to this. That's called a clipper circuit. There's another op amp, you know, a little bit of a high pass filter there. And this goes to your digital input. Very simple circuit. You can actually do this with a transistor. I was asked about actual data points. And I'm explaining the background of these microprocessors of the air. So what they're doing in the air um, is they're running a program typically that's counting time. Count a long time for a, for a one and a short time for a zero. That limits your bandwidth. Uh, you want to limit bandwidth for a couple reasons. Number one, if the tape's kind of noisy or if you've got some little losses or dropouts in the tape, you want to be able to skip over it. A uh, microprocessor can handle data that fast anyway. So if you look at this and you kind of size up the numbers in your head, you come up with kilobits a second. Uh, uh, maybe even less than that, maybe hundreds of bits a second. It's all what you're trying to do, and it's all in the limits of your microprocessor. So if you've got, I don't remember the time periods here, so that sets the rough course for your data. But you know, you got to remember. This was the 1970s. This was there are 8K computers, 16K, 32K computers. You don't have that much data. So if you wait a little while, you let the kilobits go by, you're okay. You're not going to store megabit files this way, although who knows, somebody probably did. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, I was too cheap to buy an older real tape, so I used to use video cassettes and listen to four and six hours worth of music. Very good quality, too. Sure. Did you use the uh, audio track on the cassettes, or did you try to go through the video? Both. Oh, how'd you hook up to the video to get data? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Why well, you know? Back and forth. Yeah. Well, they say history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. So if you think about the time of uh, video cassettes, it's just a decade or so ahead of uh, uh, audio cassettes. And there were companies in the era that, as I recall, did use uh, video cassette technology. Because by then you did have files that were uh, megabytes in length. And you, oh, I don't remember if you had much media digital media at that point. But uh, there were companies that made uh, digital video cassette technology. Uh, it would scare me to try to recover that now. But uh, there are whole companies which uh, do nothing more than uh, media conversion. And uh, they're the ones that maintain these old tape decks and uh, build whatever they need to build to recover that data. I think we're close to our time. Not too far off. Any other questions? I noticed they had different types of tapes also. Some were metal, some were. Well, just as in the world of audio real real, uh, there were some cassette tapes that had uh, different formulations. I guess I can be technical. <laughs> Highly detailed drawing of tape. How's a tape work? Well, kind of. Magnetic domains. A little bitty magnets. Fundamentally, uh, uh, magnetic tapes are pieces of mylar which have some kind of magnetic coating on them. Iron oxide is, is the traditional coating. Iron oxide is iron, it's little bits of iron uh, in an epoxy paint. So ultimately, they're little bitty magnets. You magnetize them, you demagnetize them. 
And that's how you record. The idea of different media is, well, you know, it doesn't all have to be uh, iron oxide. It could be magnesium oxide. There's a whole... Uh, sorry? Yeah. On and on and on. The various flavors that in between. So these all have various uh, attributes that allow you to store a little bit more information per uh, linear inch, or they have a little bit better uh, uh, fidelity. fidelity. Well, let's see, how would fidelity work in a practical well, way? A uh, dynamic range that has you to uh, uh, store a signal uh, more easily or less easily, uh, retain it uh, longer, things of that sort. Well, the, the, those, There's a whole world of that. Those fancy tapes were sold for higher fidelity audio, not, not for not for digital. In our our digital technology world, uh, we were going low fidelity anyway, so we didn't need this this kind of technology. In fact, some of the tapes that they uh, my friends recovered for the uh, Cosmac computers, some of them were, I think. Uh, other formulations. But you know, they were just using them for convenience. They weren't really relevant to our particular community. You've had very uh, I think we're close to our finishing time. Uh, is the lunch break after this? Yes, oh, yes. one more here. Is there anything I, I can cover or any other uh, vaguely related questions? How come I can't really find uh, cassette software in the first stores? Like, I can find floppy disks all day long, CDs. I have never found software cassettes. Found them where? Like in thrift stores, second oh, stores. Oh, stuff. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I, I look all the time for years, and I seem to never find software. Is it like that much more rare? Or did they get thrown in the trash more often? They were taped over for like the runs then. <laughs> <laughs> like I can find cassettes all day long that are like in the UK for the Spectrum or something. They were more popular in Europe. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's two questions. Let me, let me address both of them. We started the discount earlier. Yeah. A lot of so the, the issue of the, the Spectrum, that's really interesting. Uh, to me, uh, a person not all that interested in, in, in the 80s uh, technology of game machines, machines used for game. But the, the ZX Spectrum uh, Sinclair computer was a really, really low cost computer. You've all seen it, maybe you'll see one this weekend. Well, they had to use the absolute cheapest kind of storage, which was cassettes. So even though it was in the 80s, even though people were using floppies by the that whole world is about, about cassettes. So yeah, they're, they're more popular. You look at the, uh, uh, some of the uh, video game magazines of the era, some of the computing uh, magazines of the era, and there's this page after page of ads of all these uh, Spectrum cassettes. And then, of course, on the BBSs. So a lot of them are produced, so that's why you may, may have seen them. The other issue of thrift stores, this is what got me thinking about this talk. I go to thrift stores because I am on your palm cheek. And because I see old technology. I stopped seeing cassettes there. Um, in the last, I don't know, it just sort of occurred to me this year. Uh, I'm not seeing Linda Ronstadt cassettes or any other cassettes there. The reason for that, presumably, is that nobody was buying them, number one. Number two, all the people that would have donated them have already done so. People have gotten rid of their audio cassette recordings decades ago. Uh, so, uh, likewise with their uh, anything digital. So, this is sort of, to me, to me a, 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 a marker in time. People are losing uh, access to uh, the history of cassettes because they don't see them anymore. Sorry, I'm not going to talk about that, but there's also the hipster factor. They're actually popular now, so people keep them. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry,
So uh, I'm uh, one more question in the this comment. They're actually still in production and they're still being used uh, primarily for belonging to people because the cassette housing will take a braille uh, label. And number two, a uh, blind person can remove the cassette and then put it back in at a later date and remembers exactly where the tape was, where it left off, where a CD won't do that. So that the blind community is still using them. And of course, they're perfect size for a blind person to be able to keep track of it. It's a convenient technology. It's still convenient today. And for people with particular uh, abilities, uh, it has particular advantages. So there you go. Uh, okay. And the Guardian of the Galaxy. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 All right. Very good. Thank you all. Hope uh, you found this informative. Go to retrotechnology.com and uh, you can get the, the text of this talk and links to many, many other uh, web pages about this. Thank you.